Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. Right now on Indiana News Desk, it's being called the largest November tornado outbreak in recorded history. Across the country, more than 80 tornadoes have been reported, and more than two dozen of those were in Indiana. They picked it up and moved it. Drove race cars for a long time, and a couple times when I had a really bad crash and went flipping, the car went to flipping and barrel rolling, that's exactly what it sounded like, like you were in a real bad wreck. Hundreds of homes destroyed, dozens injured, but no deaths in Indiana. You can tell God had his hand over everybody. Ahead on the Indiana News Desk are people getting enough notification about storms. If you're in Lafayette, Indiana, and you hear a weather siren go off, uh, it might have an entirely different meaning than in Greenwood, where I live, or downtown Indianapolis or Evansville. And why tornado season is year-round in the Hoosier State. All that right now in a special episode of Indiana News Desk, This Side of the Storm. Hello, I'm Joe Wren and welcome to a special episode of Indiana News Desk, This Side of the Storm. 26 tornadoes hit the state Sunday, causing damage across several communities. Sarah Whitmeyer starts off our team coverage. On Sunday morning, the alerts began coming in. A fast-moving storm capable of producing damaging winds. The radar images looked ominous. The National Weather Service issued tornado watches in seven states. They were having weather alerts on the TV. And my stepson turned on his phone and radared it and we saw it coming. So I went to look out the back window and there it was. Just as quick as we knew it was coming, it was right on top of us. More than two dozen tornadoes touched down in Indiana. In Kokomo, two EF2 tornadoes hit, meaning they carried wind speeds of up to 135 miles per hour. I was looking out the back window back there and I saw a tree get ripped up out of the ground, roots and all, and come swinging between the houses. And I hollered for everybody to hit the dirt, take cover, and right about then the wall busted in and glass just flew everywhere. My stepson grabbed my nephew and threw him from where the table is there into the couch, which made the door window frame there miss him. My son saved my nephew's life. Like everybody says, you hear the freight train, you better get down, because I mean, we didn't even have time to react. It was that quick. And I watched my garage, you know, disappear. And after that, it just, all the windows exploded and all the insulation, I couldn't see no more. It just happened that quick, about two seconds, it seemed like, and it was over. According to the National Weather Service, one of the tornadoes that hit Kokomo was short, but the other one stayed on the ground for about 10 miles. Steelman and Miller were sorting through the pieces of their lives on Monday. I don't know how much I can salvage. We'll probably just have to start completely over. In all the debris, Steelman tried to find pictures and family mementos. Miller, meanwhile, surveyed the outside of the house. It's gone, but you can see how far it slid off the front on the foundation. But yeah, it's this was a worst side hit right here because it's coming from the south. But you can see how it separated the wall right there too. If you look here, uh, the number of homes and the uh, severity of the damage, this is probably the worst. Uh, there's, there's other areas close, but I would think this is, this is the toughest part. The tornadoes damaged 300 homes in Kokomo and destroyed 60 more. About two dozen businesses were destroyed. Although no one was killed, more than 30 people were taken to the hospital. Emergency officials say none of their injuries was serious. Around here, as you can see, it's total devastation, but everybody's okay. Thank God for that. You can tell God had his hand over everybody. Takes my breath away. Hard, hard to believe we lived through that. Just thank God nobody's hurt and we're all, we all still have each other. Sarah Whitmeyer joins us now for more. The National Weather Service is continuing to uh, update us with uh, severe weather reports. What's the latest? 
The latest we know are 26 tornadoes touched down across Indiana on Sunday. Those ranged all the way up to an EF3. But the National Weather Service says those numbers are just preliminary and they'll continue to change most likely. And our team created a map that shows the counties that were hit. The size of the area, if you look at all of those uh, tornado icons there on the screen, it's amazing. It really is. And November 17th now will go down as the third most active day for tornadoes in state history. So 26 tornadoes in Indiana Sunday, the strongest was that EF3, but remarkably nobody was killed. Yeah, and it really is quite astonishing. I know you went to a number of the communities that were hit as well. And when you go and you see you know, half of a house that's completely gone, mm -hmm. lots of roofs taken off, or a car that's in a driveway two houses down that belongs to a neighbor, it really is just amazing that no one died in this storm. And even Governor Pence, as he was touring the state this week, just said he hadn't really seen destruction of this magnitude before. We are grateful. Uh, we are grateful to God. And we are grateful uh, to all of those mentioned uh, that, uh, that apart from uh, uh, injuries that have been reported here in the state of Indiana and significant property damage, uh, that there's been no loss of life uh, in the Hoosier state. So when I was in Washington this week, though, um, you can tell people were very humble that the governor was there along with other officials. But is it too early now to start talking about the kind of help that they may be able to get, whether it be through the county, state, or federal? I mean, I think immediately after the storm hit, the focus was just on what do we need to do to get these people shelter? What do we need to do to get the power turned back on? But I spoke to the mayor of Washington today, and he said he's beginning those conversations with the state to find out what channels they need to go through to get aid to people, people, people who are homeless now, people who didn't have insurance, maybe lost everything. And it's amazing to see all these people come together in these neighborhoods too, isn't it? Yeah, and again, the mayor told me that just with Thanksgiving right around the corner, neighbors offering to host neighbors for Thanksgiving, just so many people willing to do whatever they can. Okay, well, again, Sarah, thank you for thank your you. report today. And in Kokomo, there's a lot of talk about the 1965 Palm Sunday tornadoes. Ten tornadoes hit Indiana on that day, and one of the twisters took a path very similar to the one that bore down on Kokomo this past Sunday. The Palm Sunday system is still the deadliest tornado outbreak in Indiana history. 137 people were killed in Indiana, and more than 1,200 were injured. The town that suffered most in this weekend's tornado outbreak was Washington, Illinois, where people are confirmed dead. But our Washington in the southwestern part of the state felt a blow from the storm cell as well. While no one was killed there, more than 100 homes were destroyed, and countless people say they're just lucky to be alive. Claire McInerney takes us there. You can walk around the front of the house here. Roger Watson was watching NASCAR in the home where he grew up when he met the tornado face to face. I opened my back door up and tried to get out my back door and it was coming down the alleyway here and it just grabbed me and threw me back into the house. So I just curled up in a fetal position and just laid there until it was over and then all the glasses started breaking and stuff was flying around inside the house. You know, I, I thought I was a goner. Five minutes later, it was over. I just walked outside and it looked like a war zone. The war zone in Washington includes roofs ripped off of houses, fallen power lines, and debris littering the streets. Believe it or not, that used to be a sycamore tree, but <laughs> I don't think there's much left of it now. As Watson tours the town the day after the tornado hit, he points out how the storm destroyed certain homes but left others intact. The garage is gone, but it didn't touch the cars. The storm took out the windows of Watson's house and moved it off its foundation. A large shade tree in his yard was nearly split in two. My mom planted that tree about two weeks after I was born, so that tree's like 56 years old. And, you know, I thought that tree would be there forever. and. <laughs> Now over half of it's gone. Two tornadoes passed through Washington, both EF2s. One was on the ground only a short distance, but according to the National Weather Service, the other one traveled almost 20 miles. That's rare for a tornado in Indiana, especially in November. But meteorologists say Sunday's warm temperature combined with the high dew point made the twister travel further. <laughs> The day after the tornadoes hit, the residents of Washington were trying to move beyond the shock of this situation and begin picking up the pieces. 
the focus shifted to recovery. Power crews were putting lines back up, and residents whose homes were spared were helping out their neighbors. Representative Larry Bouchon was touring the area with the mayor and the governor so he could take residents' stories back to Washington, D.C. I'm here because I want to make sure that if the federal government needs to be involved in helping with these uh, recovery efforts, mm -hmm. that my office will uh, be engaged in that process and smooth uh, the process so that we can get people, as the governor said, back to work, back into their lives and help them uh, get through uh, what is a very uh, a troublesome time for them and their families. The rebuilding process in many ways is just beginning in Washington. The streets will be cleared, power will be restored, but the piles of rubble consist of pieces of people's lives, and some of the things will never be replaced. I don't know, it's going to take a while to get, get over this. It's really devastating. And stories like that continue to come in from the areas impacted by Sunday's storms. Sunday's 26 tornadoes set a record for the number of tornadoes to hit in Indiana in November. Of course, tornadoes can happen in any season, but typically in Indiana, when we think tornado season, we think spring. Cody Kirkpatrick studies storms and weather patterns at Indiana University and explains why tornado season is year-round in, Indi in Indiana. We hear about severe weather seasons, but in Indiana, it seems like the severe weather season is all year round. Why is that? One of the things that, that happens here is that since we are north of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, anytime we have uh, southerly winds or winds coming out of the south, uh, those winds come from the Gulf of Mexico up through Alabama and Tennessee, and that brings moisture, that brings humidity to us, uh, even in the wintertime. And with that humidity comes warmth as well. And uh, in the wintertime, we get the winter winds that are typically strong with the jet stream. And when you couple wintertime winds with, uh, for example, in this last uh, event that we had uh, in Kokomo and Lafayette, we're heavily damaged with tornadoes. Uh, you get the sort of springtime temperatures and humidity with the wintertime winds. And that's a, that's a recipe for, for severe weather. What research is being done to better predict tornadoes? We knew about this event even on Wednesday and Thursday. There was an idea that Illinois and Indiana and Michigan and Kentucky were, were in danger for severe weather. And over the last about 20 years, our computers have gotten faster and we have been able to do more research about the types of uh, the environments that cause thunderstorms to develop and what causes tornadoes and we have gotten a lot better at predicting those at longer and longer lead times or two days in advance or three days in advance. And when you couple that with uh, the advent of social media in the last five or six years, it is so much easier to communicate that risk to people. The big thing that we still do not know about tornadoes, for example, right now is why one storm can produce a tornado but another one does not. Uh, only about 30% of the really strong supercell storms that are rotating and would cause tornado warnings, uh, only about a third of those actually produce tornadoes. And we honestly do not know why. The tornadoes we saw in Indiana on Sunday, I believe were EF2 tornadoes. Yes. Uh, what does EF2 mean and what's the scale? Yeah, tornadoes are rated on the EF scale or the Enhanced Fujita scale, which is a scale that rates tornado damage based on what wind speeds we think would produce that kind of damage. You can't actually put instruments out to measure the wind speeds in a tornado because of all the debris and the damage. Uh, the instruments would not survive. So we use the damage to sort of back out how strong we think the winds were based on how well the home was constructed or what type of building it hit. Uh, a mobile home will be damaged much more easily than uh, a, a two or three bedroom home, for example. And so we take that estimate of wind speed and then simply categorize it into EF0, the very weak uh, tornadoes that produce very little damage to the uh, EF4 and EF5 uh, tornadoes that uh, are just catastrophic. We should mention since that report, the Tippecanoe County tornado has been rated EF3 and others since then have been rated EF0 and EF1. And of course, no one can forget the tornadoes that hit southern Indiana in March 2012, killing 13 people. It was still winter and 
I remember a video of Henryville during the aftermath and there being snow on the ground. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk, this side of the storm. In the industry, there's a thought that um, uh, an outdoor siren sometimes can be uh, associated with a crying baby. The baby can tell you that it's unhappy, but it can't necessarily tell you what's wrong. Sirens mean different things depending where you live, and not every community has sirens, including Kokomo, one of the areas that sustain the most damage. What could change as a result of this Sunday's tornadoes? Coming up next. Frontline provides me with information that makes me think. First I shout at the television. You've got to be kidding! You won't see this anywhere else. The stories hit close to home. Truth is a very valuable commodity. They're uncompromising. I want to do something. I want to take action. It changed the way I actually live my life. It lets me make up my mind. I trust it. When I watch Frontline. It makes me angry and it makes me want to voice it. I want to make a difference. We can make a difference. Frontline. These guys are my heroes. 10,000. 15? 15, do you think? 20, 21,000? 600. 20. 18, five. 24. It's at least 40. Look, yeah, look at 40, it. 4,500,000. 650. 20. 650. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way. I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Tonight we are bringing you special coverage this side of the storm. Weather radios like this one here can save lives. Even if the radio is turned off, it will activate automatically to let you know of potentially dangerous situation. It would sound something like this here. Now that's the forecast right now, but if it was an actual emergency, you'd hear a tone and then the emergency information. They broadcast weather and emergency information directly from the National Weather Service. The city of Kokomo has a program to sell weather radios to residents at a reduced rate. People can just come by City Hall and pick one up. The city really promotes the program because it doesn't have any sirens within the city limits. Still, as Simon Thompson reports, not everyone knows about the program, and a pair of roommates say they survived the tornado only because their families notified them. Roommates Drew Larrick and Taylor Glenn are weren't sure how much attention they should pay to the warnings they heard Sunday. It's just something you don't think could happen to you. It was business as usual as they hung around the house not knowing a tornado packing wind speeds of nearly 130 miles per hour was headed their way. Uh, his mom called and said, we, you got three minutes, and we grabbed the TV and ran to the kitchen. We we're going to go to the basement, and she, his brother called and said, you guys have one minute. So we ran down there. Drew's mom and brother were listening to a weather radio. I heard a loud bang, and we just ran downstairs, and as soon as we got down there, the windows exploded, and I jumped on the mattress, and he jumped back there, and I heard the house creak, and I looked up, and it just came right at us and I closed my eyes and the next thing I looked up, I could see the sky. The tornado lifted the house 30 feet, spun it around and threw it back on the ground. It's a nightmare. It sounded it, just like a movie. We were so scared, but luckily we got out alive. Kokomo is unprotected by tornado sirens. Instead, the community relies on the media and weather radios. I've never been a fan of tornado sirens. They uh, are very limited. It's an outdoor warning of, uh, device. Weather radios are in your home. You can take it with you. You can, uh, they, you know, it has a battery backup there. Uh, wherever you are, you can take that with you and, and you don't have to rely on towers. Mayor Goodnight has been the driving force behind a program that has distributed thousands of weather radios to Kokomo residents. During a normal day, like I said, it would play like this. You can also, in the menu set up, you can set it up to be um, what time you want it to come on, only if an alert's on, or you can have it playing all the time, either one. If an alert comes on, it'll come across in the sound of a um, tone or a beep. The radios maintain broadcasts even in power outages. It'll tell you if it's just a thunderstorm, a flood, any type of inclement weather coming, it, it will alert you on that. 
Tornado sirens can cost $25,000 each. Goodnight says he's done the research and even after this week's devastating tornadoes says he doesn't think they are worth the investment. The weather radio is your best uh, source for uh, you know, any inclement weather. Tornado sirens are limited to tornadoes. Uh, weather radios can be for flooding or any other natural disaster. So uh, they are much more effective and, and, uh, and, and much more personal uh, and, and and, and people are able to, you know, to have access to them. The Kokomo program cuts the cost of weather radios by about two-thirds. The city buys radios in bulk that would normally retail for about $30. They sell them to residents for $8. Goodnight says it's just like having a tornado siren in your home. Taylor and Drew just moved into their home two months ago and say they never got around to getting one of the radios. Really, his brother saved our lives because we were upstairs and literally we got down within... 30 seconds and it, the house was just over there. As the two dig through their belongings and work to salvage what they can, they're faced with the reality that they'll likely be moving back in with their parents. I don't know how much more you can prepare for something like this. It's, it's just something you don't think could happen to you. And now on social media, some residents are saying the city needs to start a discussion about whether the addition of tornado sirens is necessary. Sometimes we're guilty of thinking about weather sirens as a magic bullet. If there's severe weather, a siren will sound and we'll know to take shelter and we'll be okay. But in reality, it's not that simple. As we mentioned earlier, talking about Kokomo, not every community has sirens. In some cases, there's not a single siren in an entire county. Plus, what's true in one area may not be true in the neighboring area. Some communities sound their alarms if there's a major fire. Others activate them only if a tornado is on the ground. Alex Dierkman reports on how sirens fit into the state's emergency alert system. The tornado sirens in Washington went off Sunday afternoon warning residents of the approaching storm. In Davis County, there are six sirens, three of them located in the city of Washington, one located in Odin, Indiana, one located in Plainville, Indiana, and one in Montgomery. Officials from the Emergency Management Office here say they set the sirens off in the event of a tornado warning either in the county or in a surrounding county. However, they don't believe it's the most effective way to warn people of an emergency. They encourage residents to use more direct methods of communication such as their smartphones or weather radios. Sirens are part of a system. Uh, they certainly help with initial warning. If you're outside, I know that we've had discussions uh, on, on many levels and, and in many different venues about the effectiveness of outdoor sirens. Even though you can often hear sirens if you're sitting inside your house, that's not what they're intended for. According to the Department of Homeland Security, the sirens are meant to alert you to go inside and turn on a radio or TV to get more information. Each community is directly responsible for its sirens. That means they have control over how many they have, where they are placed, what type of alarm they use, and when the alarm is sounded. And that can lead to confusion about what the sirens mean. If you're in Lafayette, Indiana, and you hear a weather siren go off, uh, it might have an entirely different meaning than in Greenwood, where I live, or downtown Indianapolis or Evansville. State Senator Brent Walt says he was surprised by the lack of clarity surrounding sirens, so a couple of years ago he proposed legislation that would create a uniform system. He's worried if people don't know what the sirens mean, they won't take them seriously when they're going off. But the legislation didn't go anywhere. I don't care what that system is as long as citizens know what it means when a severe weather siren goes off. What we recommend for that is uh, get educated about what your local siren means and have more than one way to get notification. Erickson says the Department of Homeland Security will advise communities if they have questions about their sirens, but his department stops short of making formal recommendations. Alex Dierkman joins us now for more. A law passed in 2008 required the Department of Homeland Security for, um, to come up with some sort of standards, regulation for sirens and whether communities should act, activate them, when, how long, things like that. That was, but it's it supposed a, to be ended in 2010, right? That's right, and yeah. I want to share just a bit of that legislation. So it reads, before January 1st, 2010, the department 
shall adopt rules to provide for the following. The first one is minimum te technical standards, including a minimum range for any siren that is to be acquired and installed in a county under a county siren coverage plan. The second is a specification of any permissible storm, weather condition, or emergency other than a tornado for which a severe weather warning siren may be activated. But the Department of Homeland Security hasn't ma made any headway on this, and when we asked them about it, they put it back all on the counties. Since Indiana is a home rule state, the counties have to first ask for help before they can provide it. Well, and that same legislation did require that counties actually come up with a plan as well, a, a detailed plan to send back regarding uh, the sirens, how many are there, and areas that aren't covered by sirens, but has that happened? <laughs> Well, that's what's interesting. The department tells us that there weren't any counties in the state that submitted a report. So 2010 was three years ago. Here we are. Uh, what's going on? Well, one of the reasons we've heard that they haven't done this is because it could be expensive. So once the Department of Homeland Security were to get involved, they would issue a recommendation and the county or city would have to follow it. So say that your county submits a report. Mm -hmm. The department looks at it and they say, well, you know, of all these different areas, there are some that need some coverage, so you should install four sirens. Well, mm -hmm. that could cost a hundred grand or more, and that's just for installation. That's not counting any of the maintenance. So what's next? Well, State Senator Brent Waltz says that he's considering if, if there's any legislation that he might be able to piggyback on. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. We now leave you with a look at some photos from our viewers reminding us once more of the impact this past week's events had on their lives. From all of us here at Indiana News Desk, have a good night. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.